Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining me for today's edition of the SMIE Consulting Midweek Roundup. I'm your host, Marty Bennett, and today we'll be taking a look at three issues in our international education news feeds that we've seen over the past seven days, and we'll be putting our own spin on what these might mean for international education operations here in the United States, and we'll also take a look at how ways that you can get in, engaged with us here at SMIE Consulting. Uh, for those of you who are new uh, to the uh, Midweek Roundup, this is our Wednesday edition every week where we take a look at three top news stories in our international education industry. Uh, and what we do each week is, uh, is look at these three issues and see how uh, they might be impacting your campuses, how other countries are potentially dealing with international education uh, news and also opportunities uh, for uh, maybe adjusting your international education strategies to, uh, to, make, to make them more uh, appropriate for uh, your target audiences and getting to in front of your target audiences in a more uh, engaging way. So we talk about all that here on the Roundup uh, each week, but I uh, wanted to start first with, uh, with a reminder for where these news stories that we cover each week come from. Uh, each week I produce a newsletter that appears Monday morning about 9 o'clock. It uh, can be delivered free of charge to your email inbox. Uh, and it's an opportunity uh, to see what the top issues in our field are in international education as well as social media uh, and how that impacts higher education uh, and recruitment, student recruitment in particular. So I take a look at those and deliver that each week on Mondays um, through research that I do on my own each week. And then we take three of those stories from the newsletter, uh, which is called All the SMIE News Fit to Share. And we share that with you on, uh, on three of those news stories on Wednesday during the midweek roundup. I also want to give a special shout out to those of you who have been subscribing to our uh, midweek roundup podcast, uh, the audio version of what you're hearing here. And it's great uh, through iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, whatever your favorite provider, uh, you can get, uh, get, get this from, directly from uh, your uh, favorite podcast source. So uh, that's uh, another way to just listen while you work or listen while you're on a run, whatever it might be. So uh, thanks again for uh, subscribing for those of you who are on the, on the podcast feed. And those watching live, obviously, uh, great to have you with us today. Uh, and Rosanna and Bridget, glad you could be on board with us today. Hope you're doing well. And uh, we're going to start first with one of the stories that just doesn't want to seem to go away. And this, is, uh, this has to do with, uh, this, obviously, the very political situation happening now between Iran and the United States uh, regarding, um, regarding, uh, re regarding the, Iran's role in uh, Iraq and as a destabilizing influence in the, throughout the region uh, through its support of terrorist organizations uh, and obviously the killing of uh, uh, Soleimani uh, a couple, three weeks ago now. But uh, it's, this has been a larger issue, I think, as it impacts international education. We're talking about primarily student visas here. Uh, we all know that uh, day after the immigration of uh, President Trump in 2017, uh, the, the travel bans were introduced uh, that included Iran uh, and other countries. Since that time, sub, uh, there have been exemptions carved out in those travel bans that allow uh, student visa applicants to still uh, apply for visas at U.S. embassies abroad and come to the United States for study in, from each of those, uh, those countries that were on the original visa ban list or travel ban list. And one of those countries that it never seems to get a fair shake, at least, uh, as this process has gone along, uh, is Iran uh, for students that have traditionally uh, wanted to come to the United States for study, primarily at the postgraduate level. Uh, they have been a demographic that for years have been uh, challenged in terms of their, their, the smoothness of their visa process. Obviously, the most significant reason, is, which we talked about last week, is that there are only three embassies, and right now only two, for Iranians living in Iran to apply for U.S. visas, since we haven't had a visa, an embassy in Tehran since 1980. So uh, that is a challenge, obviously, uh, that only uh, Yerevan, Armenia, Dubai in the Emirates, and Ankara in Turkey have been available, or have, are available, designated as 
uh, embassies for uh, students living in Iran to apply uh, for student visas. Uh, with Yerevan uh, closing indefinitely to Iranian applicants, uh, then uh, we're just living two. But this, this is a challenge that's gone on for many months uh, and many years. Uh, but it's intensified certainly with since uh, President Trump took office, primarily because you look at uh, what happens here. Uh, Iranian students are technically still allowed to apply for visas, and uh, they are still being granted visas, though the, the process has been extended dramatically from a normal two to three weeks to 12 months in many cases, uh, where there, the delays have been so extensive that it's, uh, it's really uh, led to a lot of Iranians uh, who might have ordina ordinarily considered the United States giving up because it's just too darn hard now. Uh, and part of the challenge here is for Iranian students that might be looking at the United States is, yes, they can still apply and receive a student visa. Yes, it is going to take a heck of a lot longer to get that visa. But that does not, doesn't mean they're still going to get in, they're going to be able to get into the United States. And we saw this most, most uh, explicitly last summer uh, with a group of Iranian students that were going to be attending uh, schools in uh, schools in, in the, on the West Coast, a group of doctoral students that were going to be uh, coming for study for the first time, had just gotten their visas, had been waiting forever to get, uh, get those visas and eventually enroll in the United States. Uh, and there was a, a real, a real uh, challenge here uh, for them uh, that they, 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 made, they finally got their visas, they're getting on their plane, they're coming to, the, to, to, to start their studies, and they get... Uh, put in secondary uh, secondary uh, evaluation at the airport by Customs and Border Patrol, and eventually turned around and sent home. Uh, there were even stories of Iranians that were coming for study that were uh, in the, at the transit airports uh, on their way to the United States on their connecting flight to the U.S. And they were told by um, Customs and Border Patrol official that uh, the, that does a, does go to other major destination uh, or, or our points of origin airports that are coming to the U.S. for. Uh, that they do that. They've done that in Amsterdam for a number of years uh, through, through Schiphol. But they do this in, in, at several, uh, several, many countries around the world. They were telling Iranians that were students that had visa, valid visas that they would not be allowed into the United States. Uh, and it just, there's such a disconnect. And this is what my main point here is. Uh, I'm posting some links to these stories. We've just also seen another one of a student that was just about to arrive uh, had arrived uh, to, to begin studies at Northeastern University uh, that uh, has now been uh, deported. Uh, had valid visa and everything to, uh, to begin his studies. Uh, it was, uh, there was actually ACLU got involved and they got a stay of the, of, of the student's deportation while he was in secondary uh, at the airport. Uh, that stay was, was granted, but CBP put him on a plane a half an hour later and sent him back home. So we really see some disconnects here. Um, and when you think about how the length of the process these Iranian students have gone through to just get their visa in the first place, uh, you see uh, that they wait months to finally get, get the interview and get, get, their, get the good news eventually that they're, they have been granted a visa. They get, get their plane ticket, they're, about to, they're getting either getting on the plane, about to connect to the, uh, another airport, come to the, to the U.S., arrive in the U.S., and then Customs and Border Patrol decides no. And that's the problem here. Uh, the, 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 the reasons why uh, that, that they, they never will release, uh, because they don't t talk about individual cases, why they deported a particular person. Uh, it only comes out in, uh, only from first-hand accounts from the students as to why they think they or, or were told there were challenge issues with their entry into the United States. But you think about it, these, these students uh, were interviewed at embassies and consulates around the world uh, by uh, our U.S. consul officer. Then uh, as part of their evaluation before they were granted their visa, the months-long process, they had to wait uh, because th there were all these security checks. And it's very similar to what happened post 9-11, that delays would be happening 3, 6, 12 months uh, for visa applicants from certain Muslim countries. Uh, that process is happening again. It's slowed down dramatically, particularly for Iranian students. Uh, and that is something that we is... is it, uh, well, I don't know if it's to be expected, but it's certainly been the reality. Uh, but they finally get those visas 
what you didn't have happen in post 9-11 is stories of these students. Yes, there were students that came into secondary, but you weren't seeing these mass waves of students coming in 12, 24, 60 for this past January term that were entering, trying to enter the United States, had all the right paperwork, had gone through all the security clearances and were turned away. That didn't happen back in, uh, in the same kind of numbers that we're seeing now, particularly with Iran. So this is my real disconnect uh, for the week, and, and it's been one that's been there under the surface for a long time. But how is it possible, and what evidence is there to support and give the ability for a Customs and Border Patrol officer, an individual Customs and Border Patrol officer and any supervisors that might be involved, the ability to uh, undo the work that's been done, that's taken months. Just the visa process alone has taken months for these students, the security checks that they've gone through. How all of a sudden, just based on that individual uh, customs off, border patrol officer, is there uh, an automatic undoing of all that good work, all that lengthy work, the, the perseverance that the student had to have to get through that, all that, their family and everybody that's supporting them. So for me, this is, this is a real challenge. There's a huge disconnect between DHS and State Department when it comes to Iran now. And there's always been that, but it's really exa exacerbated in the current situation with Iran. So uh, where Customs and Border Patrol issues are probably red flagging every Iranian that comes to the border, whether they're new or returning, uh, they are almost autom all automatically getting secondary. And really, uh, based and, and making decisions that we will never know about, that are based on their own personal impressions. Uh, and it's, it's rarely ever the case that, the, that, that we're seeing the whole story, obviously, but uh, the news reports are not good. Um, a, the student in, uh, that was going to Northeastern who was deported and sent home, even though there was, a judge did step in and, and uh, block the deportation, he was still deported by CBP. Uh, there were a group of Iranians uh, returning uh, to the United States uh, uh, 60 or so that were returning, uh, coming back into from Canada that were ret were turned away. Uh, so there's really some major challenges we're having here, and it's certainly one that I think um, uh, that we really want to uh, re really want to make sure our elected officials know about. And certainly that um, uh, as you as you as you think about this, uh, what 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 the implications are for what we do in international education. I just encourage you all to to take a look at uh, what you can be doing to help support your students in a more uh, cohesive way and a more uh, practical way through advocating uh, through, through your elected officials and certainly uh, lacking that through your uh, administration at your institutions to then take the message forward to their, uh, through their channels as well. Uh, so that's that's really what I wanted to start with. It's a very it's a it's a very, it's a sticking point for a lot of us I know who have been in international ed for years uh, about how that happens. Yes, State Department grants the visas, uh, and CBP has the right to admit or not admit the student to the country at the border. But the reality is on the ground when you see spikes, uh, any spikes uh, uh, that don't that are out of the ordinary and, and are certainly targeted towards one country. You, you have to think that there's something much larger at work here. And certainly undoing all the good work that's been done for a student to get to that point, particularly those from Iran who have had to wait months for their visas uh, that were granted where they did clear all the security checks, uh, yet a Customs and Border Patrol official has that right to, to say, nope, sorry, you're going home, uh, without really taking into account everything else that uh, has made up the, uh, that student's journey to get to the United States. So obviously not not a, not a pleasant situation, not a pleasant topic to talk about, but certainly one that is is going to be with us uh, for the foreseeable future, I'm afraid. Now next up, we're going to take a turn to uh, the UK, and we'll look at their version of Open Doors uh, through the Higher Education Statistics Associ uh, Administration or Agency, excuse me, HESA. Uh, they released uh, the data for the 2018-19 academic year, much like Open Doors does in November each year for the previous academic year. HESA comes out in January. Uh, they revealed that international student numbers are up almost 6% on the previous year, uh, from uh, up to 485,645 international students were in uh, higher education institutions in the UK in the 2018-19 academic year. So that's a jump of about uh, 27,000 
in, in year on year numbers. Uh, what uh, uh, the news is good all the way around, frankly, for these numbers for the UK, uh, even in the wake of uh, uh, the Brexit that's finally going to happen at the end of the month here, at least the initial separation. Uh, a lot of the details in terms of how that impacts academic uh, exchanges and such are still to be determined. Uh, we'll, we'll obviously be covering that here on the roundup as well. But uh, the numbers for this past year certainly reflect uh, increases in non-EU students uh, coming to uh, the UK, uh, also increases in EU students, first time EU students coming to the UK. So non-EU students make up uh, out of uh, non-EU students of the 485,000, 342,000 roughly are uh, non-EU. So uh, well over, uh, well, just about uh, three quarters are non-EU students studying in UK universities. Of those non-EU students uh, at British universities, we are looking now at a third, fully a third, are from China. Overall, China represents about a quarter of the total international student population in the UK, but uh, as it impacts non-EU students, they are uh, a third, fully a third of that. But the biggest jumps were actually for students coming from India. Uh, you saw uh, the second top sending country after China. Uh, they had jumps, uh, overall jumps, uh, from 18,325 to 26,685. Uh, so an increase of uh, just about eight, over 8,000. Uh, and that included 17,760 new student enrollments. Uh, and that's a 42% jump in a year for new student, new Indian students coming to the UK. So that, that uh, is driven, and many experts, uh, and certainly those in the UK will back this up, uh, feel that this is uh, entirely down to the two-year home residency, or excuse me, two-year post-study work visa reintroduction uh, that made it possible to, for students to have that two years of work permission after uh, they finish their studies. So that's certainly uh, driven a lot of interest, uh, expanded interest in, in the UK, uh, even in the wake of Brexit, which has never really been about uh, non-EU students, it's really been about the impact of, uh, on EU students, which are about a quarter of the total enrolled in the UK. So uh, what does that mean uh, moving forward uh, for EU? Uh, the first article I, I have, uh, I've po posted the link as I do all the articles we talk about here, is uh, from uh, the Pi News, uh, one of my favorite resources for international education news. Uh, the second is from uh, The Guardian uh, in the UK, uh, where uh, they focus on a third of non-EU students coming from China. Uh, that's 120,000 Chinese students enrolled at British universities right now. So um, roughly a quarter of the total uh, in international student enrolled. So uh, that, uh, that, that, that H, those HEA, HESA stats in the UK certainly are interesting when you, when you put that in context of uh, the, the US. But you look at the differences um, when we look at uh, the Pi News story, they focus on a much broader perspective. They also, in the uh, Guardian story, took a look at uh, the specifics on the domestic side as well on the total enrollments uh, at uh, UK universities. Uh, you now see, just uh, anecdotally, you might want to know that the largest institution size-wise uh, for physical campuses is uh, University of Manchester, uh, or excuse me, University College London, which overtook the University of Manchester uh, at 41,000 students enrolled in degree courses uh, compared to Manchester's 40,000. Uh, so uh, Open University, uh, uh, the on online uh, largest provider of higher education, uh, had over 122,000, but again, that's uh, uh, the number of online students as uh, all online as part of that uh, that institution. So, uh, British numbers are are going up. Uh, they even though um, even though Brexit uh, was was supposed to be this harbinger of doom for the UK and higher education there a few years ago, uh, and we certainly will have yet to see the full impact of that uh, as it impacts EU students. Non-EU students certainly have, uh, are more driven by uh, factors outside of uh, Brexit, uh, particularly those that, uh, with the reintroduction of the two-year post-study work visa, are really uh, what will drive uh, non-EU interest in uh, Britain. But uh, you, f you figure now that uh, EU students would also, though they won't have the full rights uh, as, any EU, as any EU citizen had in England for work permission before Brexit, uh, they certainly 
minimally would be able to avail themselves, if nothing else changes, avail themselves of the, the post-study work visa option. So it uh, won't be quite as robust as, as what they had under the EU when Britain was a part of the EU, um, but certainly, uh, cer cer certainly something to keep an eye on as things move forward. But uh, good news in, in England in terms of their, uh, and the UK and as a whole, for their uh, international student enrollments. So uh, we'll turn finally to a topic, and I, I have it listed here as the Save OPT campaign, uh, a hashtag campaign. I don't know if I'm starting it or not, but certainly uh, we, uh, those in international ed circles uh, certainly know uh, of the pending lawsuit that it's making its way up through the courts in the U.S., uh, that is a challenge uh, to OPT uh, and its legal, um, the, the legal, uh, its ability to exist as a as a as a benefit of for international students the work permission that uh, they have. Uh, so the, there, there have also been talks about how uh, the current administration's attempts to cut back on um, on international students, uh, though that's never been said outright. Certainly, there's the undercurrents in the anti-immigration language of the, of the administration that uh, certainly gets a lot of press uh, about what that might mean as it impacts future international student enrollments. But uh, what, what we're talking about here is um, uh, President Trump's plan uh, to regarding uh, improved STEM education in the United States. And we all know in the international ed circles, uh, STEM is, uh, particularly STEM OPT, is one of the most significant draws for international students, aside from the quality of U.S. institutions, is certainly one of the differentiators that has in past been a real attractive magnet for the United States for international students to come and study uh, STEM programs in U.S. fields because they get three, potentially three years of work permission for each degree level uh, that they obtain here. Uh, President Trump has come in uh, with a plan uh, since his inauguration uh, uh, three years ago now to improve STEM education in the U.S. Uh, as uh, has invested 540 million in the last latest fiscal year towards that end. It's a five-year plan that the president rolled out to make quality STEM more accessible for uh, Americans. Uh, that um, the, there are challenges though uh, in the way in the, just the system, the way it's set up in the United States now, because uh, as we as many in graduate education in international ed circles know. Uh, many uh, STEM fields would not, uh, d departments would not exist at the graduate level if it were not for international students. Uh, for example, there's one, uh, one example in the, sto in the story I've just posted uh, that the University of Florida in their computer science department, 95% of their graduates in 2015 were international. And that's numbers about the same in the, over the last few years. So there are many, uh, many departments that would be 65, 70% international in engineering fields, in uh, computer science, mathematics fields. Uh, the ch the, and the, one of the reasons the lawsuits have been moving forward is uh, critics argue that foreign students impede U.S. educational opportunities, according to the article, uh, by competing with American students for limited number of seats. Uh, and the research, certainly um, by an economist, Kevin Shee, has, re has revealed that it might be true for private universities, but the effect is really negligible. Uh, not st and his, his, his uh, remarks are not statistically different from zero. <laughs> I guess it isn't really uh, true there. But uh, when he looked at private universe, or excuse me, public universities, uh, the research uh, Kevin Shee has uh, produced finds that on average an increase of 10 international students in a STEM department leads to the enrollment of eight additional American students. Uh, so why does that happen? Well, we know about the differentials for intuition rates for international versus domestic. And uh, the argument here is um, uh, these international students, the, the pay that they are uh, contributing uh, is that, for, say in the UC system, roughly one third of the funding for international graduates international graduate students goes toward funding for lower income American students. So uh, as a way to help fund positions for, for those that uh, have a need to, to, enroll, to, uh, to pursue or a desire to pursue STEM fields but don't have the financial resources, that's a way that a lot of uh, state institutions are able to help pay uh, the costs of education for uh, domestic students. So 
frankly, the um, international students, as we know, in, in the field certainly, are vital to American STEM education. And uh, if, the, if policies are introduced to turn them away, uh, to reduce the attractiveness of the United States and, and potential work opportunities after graduation, those are going to be serious challenges to our continued success uh, in international student recruitment. So it's really, uh, uh, really uh, uh, something we want to keep our eyes on and certainly we'll look at, at, at the impacts uh, any uh, legal battles have on STEM education in the United States. Now, I'll finish up today with, um, with, a, with a report, uh, and I want to finish on a positive, uh, where we always like to focus on those success stories out there. Uh, we look, look back at uh, the, uh, and I look, certainly look back at my time working for Education USA at the State Department, where uh, one of the guiding mantras about why uh, international students coming to the United States, sending U.S. students abroad, uh, is a public diplomacy tool. It's a way to help uh, demystify what the United States is all about. Uh, from our citizens going and studying abroad to uh, interact with people in those countries so they get a better understanding of who Americans are and Amer our American students who study overseas get a better appreciation for the world around them. Uh, the same goes for those international students that come here. They are familiar with before they come. If they haven't had any exposure to us, they know the U.S. based on what they see on TV and in the media, in their own media. Uh, and the reality is something dramatically different for many of them as they, when they first start their studies here. Uh, every student I interview about uh, after their exposure, after an orientation program started, and we get, while they're still excited, they say, hey, what, what are you most surprised about after uh, your first few days and weeks here in the U.S.? And to a person, they would always say, it's not what, anything like what I saw on TV back home. And that's the reality, and uh, that when the students that come to the United States and experience our colleges and universities, interact with our, our local communities, they get an appreciation far and above anything that they might see on, in the media and on TV. They get an appreciation for who we are as a people, uh, what our culture is about, and uh, how we are uh, in reality, not uh, what they've seen on TV. And this, uh, this uh, last link I posted here is uh, from an Indian... Uh, uh, Indian, now Indian American, uh, who had who came to the U.S. Uh, 23 years ago as a college graduate from Delhi, uh, he uh, got his visa, and that, as he says, that changed my life forever. Uh, he did a, com a computer science master's program at the University of Denver. Shout out to uh, Marjorie Smith and uh, and the folks there at Denver, uh, and that's. He, his, his thought was that an American education coupled with postgraduate work in the States is, would prepare him for any career back home. That was the goal. But he never left. As he turned out, he, he, went, through his, um, he went through his year of practical training time at, the time, at that point. Uh, and then he, uh, the work uh, company hired him on a full-time basis on an H visa. Uh, he became a chief technology, oper uh, technology officer at a, at a company and has since become a serial entrepreneur in the U.S., and has created hundreds of jobs for Americans as a result of his studying here. Uh, and that is uh, the lawsuit that we mentioned earlier to restrict OPT um, is something he goes, he says is, it would be a, a disaster if this went through. Uh, he wants, uh, uh, he, uh, and he makes the case much like that previous article I, I referenced, uh, President, and this is from the author here, uh, President Trump says he wants to put American companies first. But killing OBT would do the opposite. The direct cost of ending the program would total over $130 million, according to New American Economy, and it would worsen an already substantial worker shortage in the STEM field. In 2015, Colorado had 15 STEM jobs posted online for each unemployed STEM worker, according to Burning Glass Technologies. Uh, finally, it would help, out, help our competitors as foreign graduates take their American knowledge and skills to other countries. And that's something we can't ignore. We're in a globally competitive market for international students uh, and in the big, uh, uh, to begin with. By putting up roadblocks and, putting up, uh, get, and turning students away, we would be losing, uh, losing uh, our best and brightest, future best and brightest from ever even entering or considering coming to the United States. So I really, um, really think there's a lot of value here that we, wanna, we certainly don't want to ignore in terms of what's coming down the pike here. 
uh, for STEM OPT and changes to OPT, H1B, all of that's going to be vitally important that we're, uh, we're still keeping our eyes on the ball here. But uh, definitely want to make sure uh, you're aware of what, the, what the, some of the core issues are that are impacting what we do, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, and how uh, we can take it to, a, to the next level with our advocacy. So thanks again for joining us today on this week's Midweek Roundup, and we're looking forward to getting in touch uh, with you again next week. Have a great time. Have a great day. Cheers.